Hello and good morning, good afternoon and good evening. So once again, thank you so much for joining us at this, this webinar, which is about co-creating methods for downscaling the donut. So my name is Andrew Penning. I am the data analysis and research lead at Donut Economics Action Lab. And I am just honored to welcome you all here today to this webinar, which is being held at a time that's hopefully more friendly to our friends in Asia and Oceania. But I know for many of you in Europe and Africa, it's the morning, so hopefully you can, you can tune in as well. Um, so I'm currently living in Europe, but I was born in, uh, in Canada in a city called Halifax. So I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that my city is in Mi'kmaq territory, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I'd like to acknowledge them as the past, present and future caretakers of the land of my birth. And actually, I wanted to invite everyone here today to consider where you are and where your families may have roots to recognize that it has very likely been the site of human activity since time immemorial. And we can consider how our ancestors have had relations with other peoples and how we too will one day be ancestors. So for me, let's, let's make what we do in the present worthwhile so that we can leave a good legacy and inheritance for those to come. For me, that's what donut economics is, is, well, it means a lot to me personally. So I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking in English, which is my mother tongue, and to thank those of you who do not speak in English uh, for the extra effort if, yeah, this is not your first language. And I'd like to finally acknowledge that our bodies are sitting at different times of the day and to thank you all for joining in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. And I hope you're having a good day in spite of the ongoing pandemic, which is impacting everyone, but in disproportionate ways, depending on where you are, both geographically and socially. So let me share our plan. And to do that, I'd like to quickly share my screen. But now, as always, in classic Zoom style, I have lost you. Here you are. So let me share my screen. You should be able to see this. So first of all, we are delighted to have Zinat Niazi and Mohak Gupta from Development Alternatives in India and Willow Berzin from the Coalition of Everyone, which is a core part of the Region Melbourne Network. So Zinat is Vice President of Development Alternatives and leads policy studies and development action initiatives. And Mohawk is an urban development professional who's focused on strategies for resource efficiency and participatory planning. And they're going to be speaking about how they're engaging uh, as part of a co-creative process that we've been holding over the past several months, um, how they've been engaging with those, with, well, with those in ideas and actions. And Willow is founder of the Coalition of Everyone and brings people together to design pathways for regenerative futures that celebrate our differences and our diversity. And she will be speaking about her experience within the Regen, Regen Melbourne network and talking about the activities that have been going on there. So very exciting. Thank you. Welcome to all of our friends who will be sharing what to me is actually the most important, well, just so inspiring to see these, these initiatives in practice. So I'm also joined here today by my colleagues from Donut Economics Action Lab, which is Kate Rayworth, our co-founder and conceptual lead, Leonora Gericheva, who is our new cities and regions co-lead, and Rob Shorter, who is our communities and art lead. So our team is uh, rapidly growing, but we still have a majority of us, I think, here today. So we're still aiming to be a small team. Um, this webinar aims to do three things. So first, Kate and I will share progress and learnings with the DEAL community on activities over the past year or so that we have been doing on adapting the portrait methodology for downscaling the donut to places. Second, as I just mentioned, and most importantly, almost, or at least as importantly, we'll hear from our special guests who, not even guests, they're friends, they're, they're a part of our extended community uh, who have been using and adapting these tools and methods to their context in India and Australia. And third, we'll invite you all who have joined today to share thoughts and contributions about this portrait methodology in a short breakout session. And also as part of an ongoing consultation period that we will launch with you all here today. 
So that's the plan at least. Um, some quick housekeeping is for those of us on Zoom, if you'd like to ask any questions or engage, please use the chat box to, to share your comments, suggestions, questions, uh, et cetera. And please keep your microphone on mute throughout the webinar. The main session is being recorded and we plan to make the recording available on our platform. That being said, the breakout session that I just mentioned, that will not be recorded. So just, just so that's clear. We are also live streaming on YouTube. So hello, internet, to those of you joining uh, on that with that option. So that's enough for me. Now I am very happy to invite Kate to share some welcoming remarks and to, to get us started. Thank you. Great, thank you, Andrew. And it's a real pleasure to be here with so many people joining from all around the world. So as Andrew said, the aim today is to share the co-creative process we've been going through on updating the methodology for creating city portraits and portraits of place with the donor. I'm gonna share my screen to make a lot of sense of that. So, so let's just pull out, it's uh, Thursday or Wednesday, depending on, or, well, it's the beginning or end of Thursday for most people in the world in July, 2021. But let's just pull out and recognize that the whole of the 21st century has begun with multiple crises from financial meltdown, climate breakdown, COVID lockdown. These are deeply interconnected and show us how interconnected we are with each other and with the rest of the living world. And we believe that these crises emerge from the very systems that we've created, systems based upon the presumption of endless expansion, which doesn't work because it ends up undermining itself. So we need to move towards a new vision of what progress and prosperity looks like for humanity. And that's where the idea of the donut comes in. One way of considering a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. The goal here, leave nobody falling short on the essentials of life in the hole in the middle, but don't overshoot that outer ring, those life supporting systems of planet Earth. So we need to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And instead of aiming to endlessly expand and grow, we aim to thrive in balance. If that's the goal, however, we know we're very far from that. This global picture shows us the extent to which millions, indeed billions of people still fall short on their most essential needs in life. And humanity has collectively overshot multiple planetary boundaries. So we are in shortfall and overshoot. We are far outside of this space. And the challenge of this generation, of our generation, is to turn this story around for the first time. We have to remember that last century's economic theories and government policies, business models and community actions and aspirations were never aimed to solve this because they never saw this. So we'd be crazy to think that old theories and policies and business models and actions would get us there. We need to come up with new insights for our own time. That can either be utterly overwhelming or outrageously exciting because we get to redesign and reinvent and remake. So this is the goal of the donor. And this was first published in 2012. And ever since then, one of the main things that people have asked is can we downscale this concept from the global to here, can we do it here? The first one was created in Kokstad in, in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Uh, an organization there took it and imagined Kokstad in 2035 and they used the donut to imagine the future. And the very first thing they did, if you look at the, the bottom left-hand corner, they added a wedge for fun to the social foundation. And that was a, a wonderful signal. Oh, people are gonna play with this. People are gonna make it their own. They're gonna make it make sense in their own place. I remember seeing this photograph from the Wuppertal Institute in Berlin, people having a, a diagram of the donut and saying, well, what would it mean to create a city donut here? And I remember staring at that and thinking, well, how would you do that? How would you take this global concept and make it local? And a fantastic study from Lake Erhai in China, researcher quantifying to the extent possible the social and ecological status of life in that water basin. And then the work of Oxfam in Wales. So many, many people in, these and other places have been aiming to downscale the donut. For me, the moment of clarity came when I heard the biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus talking about humanity belonging within and learning from nature. And she took the donut and essentially flipped it inside out in a way that really confused and then enlightened me. 
And between us, we put our ideas together and came up with what we think is a really clear and powerful framework that works for downscaling the donut anywhere. And that's what we want to share today. And that's what we're working on and improving the methodology on. So we start with the idea that can we live within the donut wherever we are? And I invite everybody listening to think of your neighborhood or village, town, district, city, nation, region, whatever scale you want to think of this at. Can we live in the donut here? Well, we want to unroll it. Let's open it up and draw it out into a space because there we've got a place to imagine and play between that social foundation and the ecological ceiling. And we can envision the future that we want here, wherever you are, in relation to the world, recognizing that always everything is interconnected. So here's the question. How can here, where we are, wherever you are, become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? And that breaks out into four questions, one for each of these four lenses that we can zoom into one by one. So we start with asking, how can all the people of this place thrive? And how can this place be as generous as the wild land next door? These are the local aspirations of a place, and I'm going to dive in more in a moment. These are the local aspirations and many places, many cities or communities are, are assessed and, and, and rated globally on this basis alone. Oh, it's a great place to live. Got great Wi-Fi, good communities and schools, and there's forests and clean water nearby. That's great. But every place must recognize that it has a global responsibility for living well in relation to the rest of the planet and all people. So we must also ask, how can this place respect the health of the whole planet and the well-being of all people? Let me dive into each of these four lenses and show you what it means to explore them and then try to create this methodology for actually bringing some specificity to it where you are. So how can all the people of our city thrive? I'm going to I'm going to think of it through the lens of a city. What would it mean to thrive here, wherever you are? It's going to be different in Bangalore or in Berlin, in Stockholm or in Dar es Salaam. What has COVID-19 made visible that was already there but now can no longer be ignored from racial inequalities to whose work is essential but massively underpaid? And what could turn out to be the greatest strength of your community and culture, enabling you to pivot? These are entry point questions, but what we really want to ask here is could we actually bring metrics and specificity to each of these dimensions of life in this place? And let me give you the example from the city of Amsterdam, which is one of the first cities that we worked with to bring this specificity. So I'm gonna take the example of mobility. So we asked, does the city have a target? Does the city have a goal on what good mobility looks like for thriving here? Yes, the city did have a target. The city is accessible to everyone via public transport in a safe and accessible way. That's the city's existing target. OK, does the city have any data that we could use to assess whether or not it's meeting that? Well, we looked and the best available data that gives us some kind of snapshot is that in 2017, residents made 665,000 journeys by bike every day. And in 2018, they gave the city's public transport a rating of 7.7 .7 out of 10. Now that doesn't tell you everything you want to know, but this is the best available data. And so this already tells us, hmm, is this target exactly what we want? Maybe it's a moment to upgrade the target. What really would it mean to have thriving here in terms of mobility? And what data do we actually want to collect? Could we supplement this with other data from communities, from different neighborhoods? How could we really know that we were thriving in terms of mobility? Let me move to social equity. The city has a target on that. Citizens enjoy greater independence and seldom experience inequality of opportunity. And I must say that the word citizens in Amsterdam, when you ask people, they say, oh, we mean residents. So I prefer to say residents, but this is the correct language from their city target. Now, the snapshot, 16% of residents in low income neighborhoods say they lack control over their lives in some aspect. And that's higher than the national average of 11%. So that's telling us something. Again, you can already get a feel that the data that are available only give us some sense of a snapshot of what's going on. And I think a big part of the 21st century project is to bring more and better data that's sensed by people, photographic evidence, official evidence, community gathered evidence, community science, so that we can really better understand how are we thriving here and what is our goal? 
So those are some examples from Amsterdam on the local social lens. What if we could actually put targets for every one of those dimensions against them? Does the city have a target? Should the city have a target and what should it be? How do you create that? And then what would be the best available data wherever you are to create this snapshot? Let me move to the local ecological. How can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? So the idea here is to go to what we're calling the wildland. That means the most healthy, natural habitat of this ecosystem where you are located on planet Earth. What is nature doing here? Because nature is cleansing the air and housing biodiversity, storing carbon, cycling water. Nature is generous. And how could your city aim to match or exceed that generosity? How could the city store carbon, harvest energy, manage and build soil? This is from Janine Benyus's work and it's wildly ambitious and yet literally utterly natural. So again, let's come to Amsterdam. I'm gonna just talk about the example of regulating the temperature. Well, Amsterdam is built in a place that would be forested. There's some wonderful natural lands nearby you can go to and the forests cool the temperatures. That's how nature does it, from the treetops to the forest floor. How can the city aim to match or exceed that? Can the city through parks and through trees in the streets? The city does and have, indeed have a relevant target to increase the use of green spaces, green infrastructure. That target could be tightened up to talk about cooling. Because if we look at the data, there is data, Amsterdam's temperatures can be up to five degrees warmer than surrounding areas due to the urban heat island effect. And actually we know that lower income neighborhoods have fewer trees and that means they suffer more from this heat island effect that undermines kids ability to learn in school. Everything is connected. So there's one example from the local social for Amsterdam. Again, what if we could put targets against all of these? Most cities don't have these targets because they're not thinking this way yet. And then what if we could bring data, whether it's official data or citizen science or sensed and experienced stories that show us how people are living and how affected by the ecological performance of their place. Now let's move to the global lenses. How can our city respect the health of the whole planet? These are the nine planetary boundaries and we know that every place through all the global supply chains it's connected to, through the food and clothing, electronics and consumer goods and construction materials imported into your place and exporting out that waste, it has an impact far beyond the boundaries of the city on the whole planet. So how can cities decarbonize their energy and mobility? How can they create circular material use and massively reduce that through flow? How can they, for example, transform their food systems as an example of one of the many systems you can transform to reduce your pressure on the planet? Amsterdam has a target on climate change, as many cities now do to reduce the city's in boundaries so the local carbon emissions to 55% below 1990 levels by 2030 and to 95% below 2050. Now I'm gonna say, I think that's just too slow for any high income city or nation. And I'm gonna call out my country, the UK here too, but it's a cut target. So let's hold the city to account against its target. Well, in 2017, Amsterdam's in boundary CO2 emissions were 31% above 1990 levels. So, They've got to get by 2030, 55% below. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of decarbonization. But the real kicker here is to recognize that nearly two thirds of the city's total CO2 impact worldwide are produced beyond the city boundaries. It's not the cars and the heating in the city. It's all the consumer goods that are imported and the emissions that are produced far overseas where those imports are made and all the transport emissions. So this means cities need to step up their ambition and take care not just of in-city emissions, but their consumption emissions. And cities like Amsterdam are beginning to do this. Now I'm holding Amsterdam up here because they're actually one of the few cities that have stepped up and put these stats forward. They're facing it. This is true in every high income city, but some cities are actually facing up to it and then can start acting on it. In another area, what about land conversion, the impact of converting land worldwide? Well, Amsterdam, like most cities, doesn't have a target on this yet. And so this is a good example. Let's create targets. Let's raise our ambition to take action on all these planetary boundaries. A snapshot, we just know that the amount of land required worldwide for Dutch consumption in 2013 was two and a half times the area of the Netherlands. That really is a snapshot. We're talking not about Amsterdam. We're talking about the Netherlands. This data is old. This is the extent that we need to update and improve our ability to take account of places impacts worldwide. And then let me come to ask, can we create 
targets across all of these planetary boundaries? And can we bring metrics that measure them? This to me is at the heart of the 21st century project of bringing the relevant metrics, especially into high income places that we know have long been overshooting their pressure on the planet. Lastly, how can our city respect the well-being of all people? Which companies are headquartered in the city and what are their business models and how are they impacting worldwide? Which multinational brands and retailers are selling in the city? And what's the labor behind the label? This is harder to pin down specifically, but there's a lot of global supply chain research that actually connects brand names that are on sale in many cities to labor rights around the world. Let me give you two examples from Amsterdam. So, Cities don't have targets around about other people, but they have all signed up through their nations to the SDGs. So let's hold them account for the SDGs. Target on health. SDG three says ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Well, people in Amsterdam and cities worldwide are using mobile phones. And if we look at global supply chain research, it shows us that actually the people producing the minerals and the metals for mobile phones are not at all respected in terms of their health. This example, a woman cobalt miner from the Democratic Republic of Congo, she says, we have problems with our lungs and pain all over our bodies. I have to say, this is not that same woman. I'm using another photograph to illustrate this quote. But this shows we can trace life in our cities, in our places, my use of my smartphone is connected to the rights of people worldwide. We can show these connections. Again, workers' rights. Promote full and productive employment and decent work for all. Amsterdam, like cities worldwide, imports chocolate. In fact, the port of Amsterdam is a massive importer of cocoa into the Netherlands and Europe. Well, they're connected to Ghana, and in Ghana, more than 3,500 workers on cocoa plantations are engaged under conditions of forced labour and there's child labour. These stats are in Amsterdam's city portrait. And when we first created it, there was a resistance, there was a shock. This, this doesn't feel like our city. But we said, but this is your city. Your city is connected to people worldwide as every city is. And then to their credit, they embraced it and published it and started talking about it. And that means they're actually now in action to doing something about it. This is true in every city worldwide. So let's pull out. These become a canvas. And then we can start to say, let's put issues that matter, like transforming mobility wherever you are. We can put it in the center of the canvas and ask, what targets does our city already have that are connected to transforming mobility here? What's the current snapshot, the data we can gather that connect to the impact of mobility here? What are the really key challenges that we know we face? What are some new initiatives we could put in place and how is everything interconnected? And that's the potential power of using this framework. We practiced this and we trialed this in three pilot cities, Philadelphia, Portland and Amsterdam in late 2019. And what was very clear that the policymakers and the community members involved really valued this opportunity to see their city through these targets and these snapshots of data and get a holistic picture of the whole city and its interconnections. And Amsterdam really ran ahead with it and published it, published that full city portrait. And we think there are many ways it can be used. It can be used, as I've just described, as a mirror on the current state of the city. And then you can use it to set a mission. OK, these are our current targets. Where do we actually want to go? Who do we want to become? How do we mobilize change makers across the city to bring about these needed changes? And how can we map onto this all the good things that are already in action? Let's celebrate the action that's already happening. How do we use this to change the mindset of policymakers, of business and of residents about what it means to be a thriving place? How do we build momentum? So come back year on year. This September, Amsterdam is holding itself to account. Where are we now on our portrait? How do we use it to monitor progress and update those statistics? And then mm -mm, it has to be irresistible. It has to be fun. It has to be engaging to do. So the power of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration is incredible. Amsterdam published its city portrait in April 2020 in the height of its corona crisis. We then quickly published the first iteration of the city portrait methodology that we're discussing here today so that anybody could pick this up and use it worldwide. And we were amazed within a few months, cities and places and nations worldwide were engaging with it and using it. Brussels created a beautiful graphic version of these four lenses. 
Melbourne, who we're going to hear from today, took it and with involving 600 people, imagine what would it mean to be regenerative Melbourne with the donut at the heart? Curacao created the island snapshot of the donut. And then an, a neighborhood, see the smallest scale that we know of, a neighborhood called Ladywood in Birmingham, they're using it to reimagine the neighborhood from street to street upwards. This is the work of Civic Square, whose work is also on our platform. I'm going to stop there and hand over to Andrew to talk about how we've now taken this first version, drawing on everything we're learning from the amazing initiatives going on to take it to the next level. Thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful to, as always, to hear to hear the story of how we got to here. And what I'd like to do is take us a little bit behind the scenes on what we've been up to over the past over the past year. So let me share my screen. Okay, so here is the city portrait methodology, and we, I mean, we flagged right within it that, well, really, the focus of it, as Kate just mentioned, was to provide, make publicly accessible, make it as widely available as possible, the methods that were used in Amsterdam, in Portland, in Philadelphia to create the portraits. And in the process, we also wanted to identify and uh, just other approaches that due to time, due to resources, due to the different, the reality of applying a methodology we didn't take, but we could flag and make identify that that's, that was another option. So to provide a guide so that others could do it. And we asked that in return people, if they do pick it up, then please adapt it, innovate with it, inspire others to do the same and share back your, your innovation so that we can in future iterations uh, build, on, build on those learnings, which is very much the spirit of this, this second version that we're talking about. So just to highlight some of the directions that we already saw, was one was to develop an approach in collaboration with Global South cities and places to adapt what was applied in all Global North cities, which have their own particular context, as Kate mentioned uh, on high resource use, uh, responsibility to act first and fastest in terms of bringing their levels of resource down and different pieces. So we recognize that that context is not the same as the context where the majority of humanity lives. And so how can we adapt those methodologies? And we're gonna speak about what well, a co-creative process that we built around that. We also identified that in those global North cities, we took just very rough snapshots based on available data, but to what extent can we deepen that analysis and start looking at things like history and power, and of course, colonial legacies and the benefits that places in the global North have, have accrued disproportionately relative to other parts of the world because of those histories. And also, as Kate just mentioned, was to adapt these methodologies. We really worked at the city scale because of uh, we had a partnership with C40 Cities and that's where the energy was, was coming from. And we have a principle of going where the energy is. But we are confident with this methodology that it can be scaled at many different levels. So we wanna explore what that could look like. And I just wanted to, flag that we already wrote this in the methodology because we were already receiving interest from, from you know, organizations and places that were wanting to adapt the methodology in this way. So we were essentially just flagging the energy we were already seeing. And over the last year, we've been trying to act on it. Now, when we speak about the Global South process, we of course recognize that, you know, I'm in Europe, as I mentioned, Kate is also in Europe, so that we need to, if we want to speak about adapting these methodologies to a Global South context, we're not in that context. And so we recognized and we, you know, invited a team, an amazing and inspiring team of contributors who could join us in adapting these methodologies and thinking about it. And Zinat and Mohawk were core members of this. And the, the whole vision was, of course, to adapt it to the context, the priorities and needs of the Global South. And recognizing that we are receiving this interest. So what we, with the team, we wanted to bring together people who understand the core concepts, who have the skills and experience to, to contribute, and who are willing to embrace this open and collaborative approach that we have rolled out. And we've identified, we're amazed to, to have 
joined us from Bangladesh, from Brazil, from places in the Caribbean, both Curaçao and Barbados, in Costa Rica, in India, in Malaysia, North Macedonia, in Zambia, and across multiple country offices of the United Nations Development Program. So that was great. In terms of process, we built the team at the beginning of this year. We invited the contributors. We were amazed and just so humbled by the, by the response. We held a series of of workshops and the plan was to have a five online workshops to explore each of those lenses that Kate just Kate just presented in detail and think about how can we adapt this to the context in a global south uh, in uh, places yeah and also recognizing of course when I say global south there's a huge diversity across the the, the context of the contributors who were who attended and we recognize that as well very early on. Then the plan is to pull together a zero draft methodology and to present that to the deal community in a public webinar for consultation and contributions. We could say that that's where we are at today. So that's wonderful to, to be at this stage. And following that, our plan was to publish a Global South portrait methodology version one that incorporates all of the comments of the co-creator process as well as this from the deal community um, sometime in the fall. That was the plan. I just have to recognize that for myself, this has been a huge learning process and it's been a wonderful privilege and an honor to be a part of it. But of course, things don't always go exactly to plan. One of them, for example, is we ended up recognizing that there wasn't enough time to hear from the many different initiatives that were already underway from our co-creative team. So we enlarged the scope to a sixth online collaborative workshop. But the biggest change by far was that very early on in this co-creative process, we recognized that the issues that were being raised to a, to a large degree applied in, in, in virtually all contexts, though of course in varying degrees. And what we realized is that it wasn't necessarily helpful to be publishing a global south focused methodological guide. And what we were really talking about is looking to publish the next version of the overall guide, taking into account different contexts. So that's the direction where we've gone now, and that's where we are planning to, to publish in the fall following this consultation period. Um, if we wanna see a little bit of the action of what we were doing, here's the team at work. It was all completely over, done over Zoom using online collaborative tools, Google Docs, Google Slides, breakout sessions. It was amazing to see the inspiring uh, content and concise uh, contributions from everyone. Here's what we did. We had the sessions focusing on each of the lenses which Kate has just described. So uh, the local social lens, the local ecological, the global, and we also considered interconnections as well. And finally that sixth session as I mentioned where we just took a step back and listened to all the things going on in those places that I mentioned. So I just wanted to flag a couple things that helped us make that decision I just mentioned to to not have a global north and a global south focus. And one of them was just recognizing some breakout groups, the types of things that were coming up when we asked, what are the questions arising? And one was around scale, others around power, and others around recognizing the diversity of places. And if we dive into each of those a little bit, as Kate just mentioned, we've there's a neighborhood in Ladywood uh, at one scale, that's the smallest scale that we've seen, but of course there's also towns and cities, there's regions, there's nations, and there's questions of course, and how do we apply this methodology? What are the criteria for choosing an effective scale for localizing the donut? And there's no right answer to that question. What we can do is think about, well, what are the governance structures? Uh, what's the jurisdiction? Does it make sense here? What are the interconnections with other places? Should we take them into account explicitly or try to think about yeah, just mm, recognizing them less explicitly. Uh, are we in a bioregion? What other things? So these are the types of questions we are we were presenting in the co-creative process, and also that we are hoping to to bring out in the breakout sessions in just in a, in a little bit. We also, when it comes to power, we have this framework where it's thinking about the design traits of the institutions who are embedded within a place and asking what can they change? What do they have the power to change? Can we look at their purpose, their networks, their governance, their ownership structures, and their finance, and think about how they can be aligned to move towards 
the goal of living a thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the goal, the health of all people in the planet? Or are we in a place where it's holding us back from achieving that goal? And we've actually developed a, we're developing a tool and a canvas to explore these questions of powers to act in more detail that we're also planning to release uh, in the fall. And finally, diversity. Kate mentioned this already. We're aiming with the portrait methodology to be as locally relevant as possible, recognizing that there are many different entry points uh, to create transformative action. And so rather than being comparable across places, each portrait is going to look and feel a little bit differently. And the way that we tried to bring this out was in the very first session, we asked the members of, of the co-creative team, what would be an alternative to the donut from the culture and context that you're in? And these were the responses that we received. And I invite you all to, if, if you see any or if some, any come to mind for you now here today of a donut shaped food from your culture and context, please feel free to to throw it in the chat. So if we were thinking about, um, actually, I'm just going to jump straight into this slide, which thinks dives into one example from the global ecological lens, thinking about the types of questions, how we can adapt this to the global South context. So Kate just presented, as we've heard, how can this place respect the health of the whole planet? And here are the, the core dimensions that, that we asked in global north cities, and we believe that it's very important to take into account. But when you think about a global south context, you can also start asking of, in some cases, especially in low consuming places, maybe the question isn't so much about how we can respect the health of the whole planet, but it's actually about how can the degradation of planetary health, which is already being locked in, how, and occurring elsewhere, how is that impacting this place? And should we recognize that and bring it into the methodology? And if so, what are the major impacts that we could, that we could draw out and how could we measure them? And would there be different dimensions? So we could think about coral reef bleaching or ocean dead zones or sea level rise or heat waves and disease spreads and who knows what else. So that's a question that, that's very alive for us in terms of the methodology is how can we take into account those two-way two -way relations? So, so far I've all been speaking about the Global South co-creative process, which has been uh, a huge learning and inspiring process for me and for us as a team. We also recognize with this change that there's a bunch of Global North, um, cities in the Global North and places which are already in action, already in motion. So in order to try to, to bring together the learnings from people who are already underway. We held a series of learning conversations where I sat down with people in Amsterdam, in Barcelona, in Brussels, in Melbourne, in Cambridge, in Copenhagen, Cornwall. Most of them are ABC places so far. So we need to fix that in balance, I think, uh, for the next places. And of course, also in Toronto. And it was really, really interesting and inspiring and wonderful to hear how these places have taken the methodological guide, guidance that we have provided and adapted it to their own context. And that as well, we want to bring into the next version of, the, of this guidance. So that's essentially what I wanted to say for now, but because the next part is, is hearing from some of those places. I just wanted to flag is that this is a screenshot of the documentation that we will be announcing after the after we hear from the other speakers. And you can see it's very much a draft for consultation. It will be available online and we're looking forward to, to hearing your contributions. I'll leave it there for now and invite members of our, uh, well, of our co-creative team to please share the things that you have prepared with us. So if I could invite Zinat and Mohak to, to speak, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Kate, for the uh, for the introduction and also for refreshing back to what we've been doing uh, for the past uh, two maybe two and a half months, I think, two months. Yeah, uh, it's been quite some time. Uh, um, uh, and uh, if, you know what what I thought we would do between Mohak and I is that we we'll just sort of introduce, and then Mohak will take over on the on really how we are now 
planning the rolling out of our work or other, rather integrating this as we move forward. But before that, uh, just to put a record that, you know, development alternatives, at development alternatives, we have been a great fan of the work of the Donut Economics uh, uh, Action Lab and the whole concept of Donut Economics, which sort of uh, absolutely, uh, I'd say it um, uh, responds, reverberates in that sense with the thinking that we, that inspires us from Gandhi. You know, looking at it very much from a from a local global connect perspective, uh, and a lot of our work in in the last thirty years has been in that direction. And uh, so, you know, it, it's very natural to for us to start relating to this. Uh, and uh, so, last year actually, it was in sometime in uh, late uh, August of last year when I, we established a reconnect we, I had uh, with, with, uh, with Kate through an ex-colleague of mine and we said, we said, okay, this is a process that we really must uh, work with because we are also working to build up our uh, urban resilience and urban transformation program. And, uh, you know, so we move from, uh, from uh, solution uh, delivery to almost a, a, a mechanism where we are working with larger communities to develop or co-develop um, uh, you know, directions to to do to for urban planning or urban services, and uh, so that is a you know that that really sort of came together in the right time. Um, no more. If I can ask you to move. Uh, so the so the so the work that we did with Kate and uh, and Andrew and the rest of your team was was really exciting. Uh, just so that we bring into context where we are coming from, the three maps that you see below are from WRI's work, and they are really what what we uh, you know what we are grappling with in India, uh, a, a, an urbanization trend which is telling us that uh, we have huge transformation happening. It's not we are still uh, we we were always known as an agrarian country till some time back. The rate of our urbanization is much faster than most in the world now. Uh, we are uh, overtaking uh, the material consumption, if I may say so, and energy consumption that I might say so. We will probably be equivalent to China in, in a couple of years of the quantum that we are demanding and needing. And uh, but, but the interesting factor is that our urbanization is a very different kind of urbanization. It's, it's large numbers of small. There are a few large, so you see the blue blue blobs that have grown as we move from 1991 to 2031, as has been predicted. But, uh, and, and, you know, I, we see the in mid intermediate, the two, 2011, we are really in 2021 following this, this trajectory. So it's not a very wrong uh, projection. The tier two, tier three cities are growing in number. That's where the most dynamic action is. Rural areas are transforming. And there is pressure, there's problems with governance, there's problems with capacity. And so, yeah, we are going into a mess, but there is a huge energy in the urban system wanting to change. And there's a lot happening on the ground and that's where really we want to be. So Mohak next. And you know, this is adapting from what we've been going through these last uh, few years. And you know, what, um, what Andrew just mentioned, how do we see this frame in, 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 in our um, context, I had actually used this frame as a, as a discussion with, with a student group uh, last month to, uh, to, an, to uh, test it out on, um, with them on a group exercise. And very interestingly, when we said we are looking at these two issues of local, locally thriving, but being responsible, we are saying we, are, we would like to be uh, prosperous, but we also would like to show global responsibility and leadership uh, going forward. Uh, it, the top right hand box uh, um, we could handle, the, top, the bottom right hand box is something which was a difficult thing in social responsibility. And I think we need to um, probably uh, uh, integrate bring that out from ourselves because we are no longer the persecuted uh, su southern country in that sense. I mean, there's a lot that we do, that interconnections that, uh, Kate, you spoke about. This is, uh, you know, there is a lot that we are doing and the way we are growing, which has a, a huge uh, social impact 
cultural impact on the on the on the uh, on regions outside of our human settlements. So just thought I would sort of bring this out there. But as so, let's go next. Um, uh, so I'm going to hand over to Mohawk a bit to to highlight these uh, co-creative issues uh, and, and things. And then you know, Mohawk, over to you. What have okay. we? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for setting the foundation for what we've been doing. Uh, in terms of what we've been working on for the past few months, uh, in during the co-creative process, first thing we realize is that across, when you look at region, uh, regions across the global south, we realize that many there are many similarities in just the fundamental nature of challenges, despite all the diversity that we've been talking about. Uh, often some issues remain fundamentally similar. And uh, one of the things, another things that uh, we were just talking about right now in terms of scale, uh, we realized that in, in, in our regions, there is a need for connecting systems across hierarchies because we have national and subnational governments which hold the decision making powers as well as the financial revolution, whereas we need action from the local governments who currently have low capacities. And when we talk about hyper local bodies in terms of neighborhood organizations or RWS, they have no agency yet. So these are these are hierarchy, hierarchical issues we need to address. In terms of the deal methodology itself, we realize, we realize that the fact that the uh, principles for, from deal are so scale and sector agnostic, it gives us a lot of uh, room to innovate and be creative about how we apply the tools and methodologies while we still raise questions on both the local and global system impacts. So one of the things like Zeehan just mentioned already was like how can Indian cities specifically, we're talking about the smaller tier two and tier three cities, but how, how can we make them respond to global social challenges? So there are, uh, there are issues like this, but uh, what the list of indicators does, uh, the, the, the indicators that the team has developed, it allows you to pinpoint uh, sectors, the ones highlighted in yellows are ones uh, that we believe are our ta target areas we are already working on and we would like to build further using this methodology, plus also some indirectly impacted sectors of work. So, uh, so and, but you're constantly forced to wonder what are the impacts of the local and global level and which, which box they fall into. So I think that's just a reflection from the, uh, the methodology that, that I find is, is very relevant. Based on our work so far and based on what we do at Development Alternatives, we, there are some key themes we, that we are taking forward. One of the biggest issues, of course, that has come up time and again is, is the focus on localization now. And when we talk about localization, we need to realize that uh, there is need for economic growth to be localized. So we need policies that invest in creating a locally oriented economy and, and leads to community wealth building. So that needs to be a big focus from the local government levels as well. And uh, the same applies to decision-making. Uh, the issue of power comes up again and again in, in, in developing country contexts. And <clears throat> so it is, we realize that there are always going to be some local power dynamics. So how do we navigate them? And how do we analyze issues that are actually based on uh, the criticality of the issue, but also how actionable they are in the in the given scenario and what the political will is that is going to take it, push it through. Uh, then we also want to make sure that the solution delivery, delivery itself can be localized. So we want to create platforms where uh, decision makers can be matched with solution providers. So you, in a sense, you are encouraging local innovation and enterprise to take place. Uh, one of the issues we already know going into the process is that there are going to be uh, problems with availability and access to data. So in, in, our, uh, in our countries, we imagine that there are going to be questions about how sufficient the data is that is available, but also of what is available, what is the quality and reliability of it. Uh, then again, linking back to the power issues like who, uh, who owns and controls the data whether the data we are referring to, it's, it's developed by the government or is it, it does it have private interests at place? So all of those things, uh, issues of data reliability again come up. And then whatever data we have, how is, is that communicated and delivered to stakeholders? So we need to work on all of these aspects of the data uh, bank as well. Uh, then keeping the deal methodology at the heart of it, if we want to drive urban transformation, uh, we realize that it's going to be very important to strengthen the forward and backward linkages. Uh, I'll explain this in the next slide. So going, uh, going forward, we tried to actually figure out that if we want to do the city portrait methodology as an exercise, what is the value chain that we're looking at that will actually enable the methodology to deliver results? So, it, and there are backward linkages as well as forward ones. So starting from the left, the backward linkages to 
to be able to reach a position where uh, stakeholders see value in doing this methodology we need to first of all uh, develop partnerships in our case we are developing partnerships with cities and uh, working investing heavily with academic institutions as well as residents so through these partnerships we hope to engage them and and do use it as an opportunity for capacity building so through trainings and workshops for and with policy makers and students so so that we are now in in a position where we can actually start applying the methodology and and going through the through the drill and for that uh, one thing that we realize in the uh, in the middle of this process is of course setting up those data collection mechanisms so one of the ideas going in and i think this has come up on the chat as well that that we need to leverage the power of new data collection mechanisms to actually uh, ensure uh, that that the data that we have is usable and for that going in we can probably come up with a city dashboard that allows for concepts like citizen science and crowdsourcing of data to really take uh, take root and and through this we uh, because we are also working with academic institutions so we see an especially strong role for the for youth uh, so for students from schools and colleges who can help in this process in collecting data and designing these systems as well and of course then you also need these data mechanisms to be able to monitor and track progress so having these backward linkages in place then allows us to go ahead with the portrait methodology and which which is basically essentially it's a mapping and visioning exercise for where the city is and where it wants to go in terms of all four lenses so we use the exercise to identify a city's pain points and then we also take it forward to actually uh, reach a point where we are able to deliver solutions for these issues as well so the first step towards that the other one we hear on top is is we need to work with policy design in terms of creating the ecosystem that allows for the solutions to uh, happen we work with communities and local stakeholders for collaborative solution designs uh, and uh, we create platforms for connecting the uh, the for matching and connecting the policy makers with the solution providers and uh, finally to the solution delivery in what we are focusing on is is uh, is breaking down urban services into chunks that can be provided by local enterprises so responsible delivery of urban products and services for community wealth building so the idea behind this uh, the process is to really activate the value chain so that we we have a successful uh, visioning exercise and it also leads to results so uh, moving forward how we are approaching this is uh there are two kinds of platforms we'd like to present focusing on two different approaches one is the action action research part of it and then the collaborative solution design so one of the platforms that we have developed recently and we are going to be using for our action research is a center of excellence for resilient human settlements in the western himalayas so one thing to point out here is that of course the the scope for this center is more geographical so we're looking at the mountain systems in the himalayas but also to say that we uh, we deliberately chose the word resilient human settlements instead of urban or rural because uh, these are areas where we require uh, where we realize that urban and rural linkages are going to become an important frame of analysis so in in that respect we want to uh, we we think we think that the deal methodology can very easily be applied to cover those linkages as well so uh, under this platform the opportunity for us is to actually set up these systems for research and training especially for this geography and then engage diverse voices for the uh, visioning exercise uh, the second platform is 11 which is our urban transformation platform and here the focus is is more about encouraging enterprise and connecting them to city governments and designing solutions so this, this does not have a geographical but a more sectoral focus of of systems and technologies that we are working with currently and we hope to sort of expand this further but what this does for us is essentially this approach actually becomes a reiterative kind of a model where the action research is driving impact because we are designing sol solutions for the same and that helps us being build further engagement for to conduct more research so this is this is the kind of model we are working with to give you an example uh, like i mentioned in the himalayan region the focus is going to is going to be regional as well as cities so we're going to be looking at uh, sectors specifically like the construction sector because we realize it has a huge impact uh, in terms of the building materials we use the technologies that we use so uh, that's one high impact sector we understand that it's a it's an ecologically fragile region so we want to uh, we're going to be working with a view on disaster resilience both at a macro and micro level 
then thirdly of course economic opportunities livelihoods is a, is an integral part of any work we do so uh, so these are this is an issue uh, that at the local level that needs to be addressed as well uh, because these are uh, heavy tourism dominated economies uh, there is a potential to link the redevelopment of even villages and small towns with ecotourism uh, initiatives water sanitation health issues remain a big part uh, big problem in these areas still so that's something we need to work on along with the uh, open spaces density and shared resources especially in the uh, urban areas in the mountains so 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 you uh, so the idea is that uh, different initiatives will have different kinds of focus areas these are some of the target sectors we are hoping to uh, work on under our mountains initiative in terms of the way forward this is this is uh, this is what we've discussed so far to sort of summarize what we're working on is really the partnerships and capacity building now so working with uh, all different kinds of stakeholders to work on systems thinking and and uh, really putting the deal methodology into practice and engaging these uh, stakeholders through training programs immersion exercises with uh, universities and short courses in order to sort of <clears throat> be able to co-create knowledge and disseminate it in a useful fashion our focus is uh, primarily resource circularity issues uh, sustainable consumption and production then really working on decarbonization and circular economy and uh, we we're trying to be very mindful of the local and global responsibility that we hold and at the local level we want to uh, we want to foster and foster an ecosystem which allows for local green and social entrepreneurship and then at a larger scale be able to leverage the industrial symbiosis to actually create closed loop and regenerative processes and that's what we're looking at uh, that's our presentation so we're open to questions zina if you have something to add uh, if you like me to go back uh, thank thank you thank you mohak uh, so this is uh, really a, in a sense uh, i'd say the first of the first few that we have shared uh by you know platforms on which we have been sharing this ideas it's it's uh, the the uh center of excellence is a is a new initiative in association with the dehradun institute of technology university in the western in the, in the western himalayan state of uttarakhand and uh, has a support now from the department of science and technology not financial at the moment the, so you know it, it's really the last it it it's really where um, kate mentioned we go where the energies are and the uh, you know as as we we work in this region we found partners and organizations that are very keen to look at issues of um, localization and human settlements and so uh, in a sense we are uh, like a magnet trying to draw people together and 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 start working on that uh and uh, the formalization of the process takes time but i think that doesn't stop our action from being initiated uh we hope at some point we would come back to this forum and maybe more to say okay six months down the line this is where things have moved this is how we've tested the methodology this is how we've got data in this is how we are moving forward so yeah thank you Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. That was really, really inspiring and wonderful to see. Um, I'm, I'm, all I can say is thank, great, thank you. We are looking forward to, to continuing this relationship and to having you back in six months as you, as you <laughs> consider it a date. That's wonderful. Um, so if there, we have a couple moments for questions. I noticed there was one question about uh, the partnerships, which you answered in the chat, Zina, but did you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I think uh, I think one uh, one question that keeps and, and it's it's a very valid question. In what capacity are we building these partnerships? Uh, we are not a government organization. We are not researchers of of the traditional academic kind. Uh, we are not corporates with loads of money. to come in and start we are a civil society organization and a think tank and uh, you know so we it's it's in our dna to look at uh, um, what do i say transformation process transformation processes for for taking our societies to a better place or helping wo walk with our societies to a better place and i think that's what uh, that's what drives us and so we call ourselves catalysts in that sense we call ourselves innovators Uh, if you may say so uh, and and so we bring people together to catalyze innovative action 
and uh, so yeah in that sense we have we have no position but yet you know that that's how i suppose things happen uh, we are entrepreneurial in our approach we are but we are civil society in the way we we work Wonderful, thank you. And that sounds like, well, as we know, has a lot of has a lot of overlap with how we see ourselves at Donut Economics Action Lab, of you know, just simultaneously not having a structured role, which allows the freedom to, of course, move in in where the energy goes. So, thank you so much. Um, I think, in the interest of time, uh, I will close this. Part, this piece and unless there are any final final comments then there seems I would... to be one, one other question but maybe Zinat and Mohak can pick that up in the chat as well sure did you did you have that question handy Leonora Some, uh, Pratisha asked what was the hook for the cities to come on board how did you approach them or they approach you okay. is this the okay. Yeah, maybe I can do a very quick this thing. The process that we are following, and uh, we, like any other organization, uh, dependent on project funds, we use our project funds to engage. And uh, so, as of now, what we have been doing is working on what we've called uh, resource assessment work for um, for certain resources, building the materials, water. Uh, systems and we work with the cities in that process as researchers to give them, them back the knowledge and that is the way we engage with them to to bring them on board uh, we've we had a whole series of seminars last year that uh, brought some of the cities that we are now working uh, wanting to engage deeper with along with some uh, entrepreneurial startup solutions for the kind of pain points that they had identified and those webinars and workshops were our mechanism to understand the challenges uh, what uh, the city is facing also what solution providers face and and so that's so these are like building blocks and and, and connecting points that we then use as hooks to come together great thank you thank you well, wonderful. It's been incredibly inspiring. I'm looking forward to, to, to everything. Um, can I please ask uh, Willow if you're ready to, to share about Regen Melbourne and Coalition for Everyone? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I will just get my screen sharing on. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah. So, um, Firstly, just wow, it's so inspiring to be in this um, network with amazing people doing amazing things. And thank you, Zinat and Mark and Kate and Andrew and the deal team for having me tonight um, and with everybody here to share this, this time in your mornings or days or evenings. <laughs> I think it's a very mixed time zone. So that my name's Willow Berzin. I'm um, um, calling in from, from Melbourne. Um, it's actually about a year ago to the day, I think, that Kate did a talk at the Small Giants Academy and a bunch of us all were so inspired that we thought, oh, can we do this here too? And I was one of those people hopping up and down like a mad person going, this is amazing, this is so inspiring, let's do this. So that's kind of our time frame from, from that sort of initial inspiration, catalyzing moment to, to where we are today. Um, a bit about some context behind that is, so my background is actually Jewish European, it's Scandinavian and British, um, but I am was born in Australia. And having spent most of my adult life living in London and Europe, I feel quite connected to some of the places that many of you are probably calling in from as well. Um, since returning to my hometown of Melbourne, um, I'm much more aware of the growing desire to reconcile our history here on this land that was never ceded. Um, and our story here is unique when we think about the 60,000 plus years history that our indigenous custodians of the land and the air and sea have held. And I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and that some of us here may also be calling in from other Aboriginal lands and to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. So look, wearing um, two hats actually. One is as a convener of Regen Melbourne, which I'll come back to in just a minute. But the other role I, I play is uh, with the Coalition of Everyone, which is a little bit the idea, as it says, it is what it, is what it says on the tin. Um, 
but it exists to repair and build a democracy. And we do this using uh, participatory and deliberative practices, spreading collaborative decision-making tools far and wide. And our vision is a future where collective wisdom is celebrated in service of a healthy and an equitable planet. Um, so we are very much aligned. And as one of the conveners of Region Melbourne, I'm absolutely delighted to share um, some more of the story of how we have been playing with the Donut Economics Framework so far. Um, Regen Melbourne is so far a network of over 60, uh, sorry, 60 organisations and over a thousand individuals embracing using the donut as a compass towards a regenerative future for our city. And I will show you some slides. Um, whoops a days, that's a terrible cursor use. I'm not used to that one, excuse me. First slide. So this is a little bit of the methodology um, that is the back, background to our first project that started um, officially publicly in the beginning of the year, but before that we sort of formed a network in, in October of last year. So Melbourne's unique context is we have now, I think been had over half a year in lockdown. So we have a quite strong lockdown rules that we've all been through and there's some kind of collective, uh, perhaps you use trauma, it might be too strong a word, that the people of Melbourne have been through a lot together through this to try and uh, come through the time of the pandemic in different ways to other places. So we have a unique context that we've been through that has come, this has run alongside that. So our community activation started at the end of last year and, um, and then we held this engagement phase where we held participatory community workshops that were very um, inspired and influenced by the uh, Donut Economics Action Labs um, framework methodology tools for the city portrait. We held five workshops. They had about f uh, 60 people each um, over the course of um, the weekly for February. And each one was a different part of the donut. At the same time as this, there was a series of leadership interviews with some prominent Melbourne people, quite a diverse um, group of people that was also understanding what they were thinking about being in lockdown in this time. Um, and then from those, um, those workshops, we collected hundreds of sort of data points of what people's visions for a healthy Melbourne, a connected Melbourne, an enabled Melbourne, an empowered Melbourne, Melbourne and an ecologically healthy Melbourne might be. And there was a synthesis process that was sort of the distillation of all of these hundreds of different points that was um, put together by a wonderful team of different service designers and facilitators, a really diverse group of people that had stepped into a facilitator network to help support the work. Um, and the insights were collected and put together in a report, but we also then fed this back into a series of roundtables with other prominent sort of groups and networks to build um, and ensure that we were actually speaking in a way that resonated with other people in Melbourne and connected to all of the other work that had come before as well. So to ensure that we weren't just trying to reinvent the wheel, but actually listening to what already exists. And that came together in a report, which is um, public on the website. Everyone's welcome to read it. it. There's a short one and a long one, and I'll put the link in later. And we launched this at the end of April after Kate did an amazing keynote at our Melbourne Knowledge Week. So that was our first project. From this, <clears throat> Let's try my cursor again. Here we go. We co-created a vision statement for Melbourne. Um, and I think at this point, there was possibly up to 600 people in the network that we were reaching to and speaking with and listening with. And there's six sort of parts of the vision statements is that a regenerative Melbourne is knowledgeable, full of life, affordable, connected through culture, collaborative and enabled is the point that we got to for how we see our city moving into a thriving and, uh, and safe and just space. The sixth one, the enabled one, that our economic and governance systems enable these other visions to come to life is the one that I geek out on and think that the role of democracy is so important to help people be empowered to, have, um, to take agency to act. Um, and from that, we did our own contextualized version of the donut. Um, we slightly adapted it the inner rings um, in the left side, we opened out networks to become about art and culture. Melbourne prides itself on its art and culture scene, which has been decimated through the pandemic and the lockdowns. Mobility and access to information. 
we also added, I suppose, through the context of, of Melbourne going through the, the hard lockdowns, we all realised the importance of community and relationships and that without them, we are much poorer for it. And so we added these to the, to the inner rings and our reconnection to nature. I think everybody realised the, um, the time that we had when we could go was so much <laughs> we just wanted to be in green spaces or blue spaces anything with nature it was a calling to be connected to nature with and then this orange part that is this binding ring I think is is the, the bit that we realize that the inner and the outer rings actually um need to be together and connected because it well it all is interconnected anyway but this process of healing and reconnecting to country and each other is also part of the reconciliation process And then we have half a dozen guiding principles that we that came from this process as well. Um, I'll, I'll try and read through them quite quickly. Um, so we recognise and honour the connections to first peoples to country and value their contribution to caring for and managing the land and waterways of Melbourne. We commit to building reciprocal relationships that build a safe and just future for all. We believe in the balance between wisdom and action between pursuing research to increase our knowledge and undertaking projects to generate change on the ground. We value lived experience as an important expertise and centre this in our process. And we value both community-led approaches and sector-based expertise. We will move at the pace of trust in our ongoing community engagement, and we aim to create less hierarchy and more dialogue, creating circles and donuts, not silos. This is kind of the principles that we, we take through in our work. Um, I hope you can read this. I won't read into the details of this. It's all available on our website if you wanted to find out more. But from this process, we came up with a roadmap for the next couple of years of how we see the way forward to bring us into the safe space. It's about 12 parts. It's um, the beginning of a co-creative vision and roadmap um, and so since this was released at the end of April, um, <clears throat> I suppose we've been in a, a different phase, which is now starting to work out what, what, how do we do this part next? How do we actually activate the roadmap and how do we engage our communities and how do we ensure we're listening to the most marginalized and unheard voices and bring everybody along with on this transitioning process? Um, I, yeah, I will send the link if, if anybody wanted to look into more details of this. But basically the, the, the 12 parts are starting to take shape into four main groups. There'll be a, a research um, element and a group of organizations coming together to help the research parts. There'll be storytelling um, projects and of course convening. <clears throat> and so what happens next for us um, is basically the opportunity is to bring people together, organisations and individuals, to find their role, I suppose, in the roadmap. Um, and uh, Kai Lofgren, who's one of the masterminds behind the strategy of all of this, who couldn't be here tonight, but he basically has been doing some very heavy lifting in the background to help establish Regen Rail to become an anchor collaborative, which is a really interesting term I'd not heard of before. He, he raised that to us, suggesting that, that Regen Melbourne can act as a way for all of this work to come through, for people to collaborate on, and so that we can um, take action on our common goals towards this destination that we're heading towards. So <clears throat> with that all in mind, um, yeah, the, the opportunity really is basically how can Region Melbourne bridge system silos and create a network of networks to move our city into the donut um, and next, it's about building the capacity to deliver the 2021 to 2023 roadmap and towards how we can get us into the safe space described by the donut by 2030. So we've got a really ambitious vision. We've got a really ambitious uh, sense of it, but there is movement and it's really exciting and people are responding to it really well. So what happens next is we'll start to share this more publicly, uh, this bigger strategy of how we get, get involved next for the next stage of the project. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Willow. That's, it's just, it's amazing to have seen the, the 
just the thought and the care that's gone into thinking about that vision for regenerative Melbourne and identifying the principles and it's all very, very well structured. I haven't received, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues have seen any direct questions um, for you. Looks like- I'll, I'll jump in with a question. Hi, Willow, that was fantastic to hear. Okay. And, and I just want to ask a question, which I know is already a live question in um, in your conversations and we've had with Kai, which I know that the, the work has begun by focusing on the local aspirations of, of a regenerative Melbourne. What does it mean to be thriving people in a thriving place? And I know the next step is going to bring in, how do we, how do we situate that in our global responsibilities as a, as a, a wealthy city in the global north? And I saw actually in the chat box earlier, someone said, oh, there's, when I was talking about how do we think about our connection with the clothing and the food and electronics and materials that are coming from all over the world and going out, someone posted, uh, the, there's a nice exercise. You can say, you know, the world in my teacup, where did my teacup come from? Where did the tea in my cup come from? Where did the, who did the work? And what I love about the work you've done in Melbourne is it's so engaged and engaging and participatory. And, I wonder if actually anybody on this call or and indeed yourselves have ideas that, okay how will you bring that same level of engagement and really helping people think about how we in Melbourne are deeply interconnected with the whole planet and with people worldwide it's just lovely to hear any ideas you have and I invite anybody on the call to put in the chat box possibilities of how to help people who show up in a room and say what's this about to think about these deep interconnections with the whole world. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. So um, yeah, we, we started the, the portrait methodology process and it's, it's by no means complete. We've touched the edges of it. And that's part of the next part of the, the roadmap is to do a deeper version of that. And I think um, it was when you did your keynote in, um, in April, seeing the diagram that you couldn't fit on the, on the screen of Australia's overshoot, you had to scale it down because it was so big, was just horrifying. It was, it really, it's like, oh, we are so privileged. We are so, um, I don't want to throw out all of the negative words right now. It's, it's, it's really shook me up a lot, I think, and, um, and others as well. And I suppose having that awareness I think it's the role of communication and storytelling um, I'm not a natural storyteller I have I'm a recovery marketing and advertising creative if anything but I think what is um, people respond to is being able to put themselves in a story and it's the telling of stories that are hopeful um, and show change even if it's the smallest ones like I love that little is it Birmingham where there's like a, a city at a neighborhood level they're just so wonderful it's like the more stories we can tell and the more stories we can share and inspire and have a accessible and inclusive process where people feel like their voices are heard and count and can be you can do something it's I think a lot of Australia while we have 80 percent of I think it's 80 percent of the population are worried about climate change but if you ask anybody nobody knows what to do so there's this kind of gap between concern and, and obviously there's different audiences, concern and then ability to take action. And, and I hope that as this movement builds, it becomes more accessible to others to be able to step into roles too. Exactly, exactly true. And, and I, um, one of the aims that we've done in creating this four lensed portrait that says, let's look at here and our connection with the world is precisely to help all of us figure out what are really compelling ways to make this accessible and, and just becoming obvious to each and every one of us. So again, I invite everybody on this call to think about how would you in your place help residents who show up to really think about how our daily lives are interconnected with the whole planet and with people worldwide. Because if we can crack that, we can design amazing workshops that just make it fascinating and very eye-opening to people and then massively extends our sense of moral concern of what we have responsibility for and connection to and an action right the possibility of action to take action in our own lives that affects the whole world so thanks a lot Willow I'm just really looking forward to seeing the next next phase of this amazing work you guys are doing thank you likewise <laughs> me too me too um it 
one of the comments that you mentioned Willow about uh about stories is I very much sympathize with that I find I'm not a very uh natural storyteller I think of myself almost as a like I like data analysis I like numbers I like kind of writing code and sitting with my keyboard and then but I love stories so just it really is it's just such an important element So Peggy and Sharon, over to you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Kate, for that presentation. Nice to see you all. Thank you, uh, uh, members of the deal. I'm going to share my screen and talk to you about what we've done here in Barbados. Okay, let's see here. Can you see my screen? Everybody? Nope. Not yet. Nope. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, you can't. Okay. All right. Here. I'm going to go back here and do share my screen. Share screen. I'm allowed to, right? Okay. Here we go. That looks good. Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> okay. Great. Here we are. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> that little glitch there. Okay. So here we are. Those are some pictures around Barbados. And, um, this is just, we put together what we have done just to share with you in this webinar. Um, I'm starting and then Peggy will follow me. We have taken a programmatic approach and what we have done is, as you can see, we had a launch in February where we invited a lot of people. We did, of course did all of this online. Uh, we had a stakeholder database and we invited a lot of people um, and we got a lot of interest and it was very exciting. And so then we followed that with some action scoping. We said, okay, if you're interested, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear what you're involved in and what type of things, what type of actions you think would be good for in Barbados to more conform to more of a donut um, application. Okay, so we've, we've done the action scoping and now uh, we are here and following the action scoping, we came up with four areas that we would like to pursue. Um, and the first one is working with women within existing networks of fisher folk and vegetable vendors to enable them to reflect on elaborate projects to manage their multiple roles. This is Peggy's uh, real interest, and she is going to talk more about that. Uh, so working with, um, uh, on the local level, with women primarily. And then uh, the second one, monitoring and lobbying for a transparent management of fertilizer and pesticide use. This was very much interested. Everybody was very interested in this one. And then implementing the Barbados open space system by supporting the development of trails. And we say especially the Barbados Trailway, which is a bicycle uh, uh, tour or a bicycle route all along the old Barbados train track. And then finally, recycling in general and including construction waste by working with contractors, looking becoming more of a regenerative uh, type of society. Okay, so then we'll go to next to action plans, some pilot activities, and then, you know, on, onward from there. So how do we uh, connect with the donut methodology? We looked at these four questions and we said we would like to uh, begin by the first with the first two. And then we would look more at the first two questions. What would it mean for the people of Barbados to thrive and what would it mean for Barbados to thrive within its natural habitats? We wanted to start with those first two. And then as interest um, and engagement increases, then we would move to question three and four about what would it mean for Barbados to respect the well-being of people worldwide? Or what would it mean for Barbados to respect the health of the whole planet? So with our first, and I'm going to talk to you about the action scoping, we went to people when our um, sessions and we asked questions around those two first two questions. Okay, we're, we looked at the social foundation and I'm just showing you a couple of photos of local women working in the, in the fisheries, flying fish, uh, cut boners in Bridgetown and sea egg breakers at Bashaba. Okay, so the social foundation was that we classified those four areas, healthy, 
connected, empowered, and enabled uh, into four those four categories. And we asked questions of our participants around those areas. You know, uh, we, we broke them up. We had four working groups, and then they took each of those and had people comment on, you know, for instance, I was in the healthy one. So people talked about, what about the food in Barbados? What about the water? What about housing and, you know, and, and health? And so we, we um, had people talk and break out groups and we collected their responses. So as to the four, those four components, it's not surprising that they're all interconnected and, and we believe those will um, be clear as time goes by. Uh, now, with the other group, had they looked at the ecological ceiling, and we did not discuss, as I said, we did not discuss the external. Water was not discussed because we didn't have anybody show up from, from water. We invited people to join according to their interests. And although we discussed water in the, in the healthy one, we, we got a lot of information on that. But we talked mainly about pollution, land use, and biodiversity. So now, learning from the deal, how was the involvement in the co-creative uh, team, how that was useful, and challenges that arise. We see what challenges that arise from that. And I'd like to turn over now to Peggy to talk with you. Are you there, Peggy? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Sharon, I need you to move this, the um, right. So we were asked to say, you know, what were the insights for Regenerate Barbados? You notice that, first of all, we changed um, we adopted the, 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 the idea of regenerate Barbados because we um, use the donut methodology. Um, I think the first insight was recognizing the connections between environment and the economy. And I think that that's really the key to dealing with climate change and the crises in the political economy of globalization. So it's what actually attracted me to this group in the very first place. I think too often people don't make those connections. Um, a lot of silos there, a lot of people working on environmental issues, but don't look at social and economic issues. Um, and what is uh, unfortunate when people do that is that they don't notice that when it comes to a choice, you know, between economic interests and uh, social or environmental ones, um, whenever there's a powerful economic interest at stake or threatened, uh, that always comes first. That is always, that always trumps the um, environmental and social considerations. So we need to pay attention to that. And um, donut economics starts there for me, it starts there. Uh, the other thing that, that I found really, really useful about using uh, is, the, is the methodology. And methodology both in terms of the questions that are asked and the organization of the data. So um, I love this uh, quotation, the right questions are, are more important than the right answers to the wrong questions. I find that a very useful guide. And certainly when we're looking to downscale or adapt donut economics to different scales, uh, the questions are the, are the most important ways. Not the answers, but the questions, because the questions can be answered and need to be answered by people in their own locations. Um, for me, the, the very first foundational questions, you know, how can Barbados be a place where all the people thrive. It's a reminder uh, that not everybody's thriving. So for me, um, a feminist, social justice activist, that's where I would want to start. Make sure that, that there is space uh, for the voices of people who are not thriving in Barbados. Um, the question about the environment and the ecological limits a very important reminder that we just cannot continue to destroy our environment um, and still continue to live. That in fact, um, what nourishes us, not just the air we breathe and the water, but the beauty of our, our island and also, uh, it's our source of livelihood in the Caribbean. 
tourism, agriculture, fisheries, all of it environmentally based. Uh, we have to take care of that. And then how you organize that data, how to make it manageable. Um, I found very, very helpful those, um, as Sharon showed, the, the four clusters of healthy, enabled, connected, and empowered. That really helped us in our scoping uh, to separate people into smaller groups uh, and then to come back together to see the connections between all of those, as Sharon was pointing out. Um, I want to turn to the challenges now. Um, yes, and the, the most important challenge, which I don't, again, I don't think that they're necessarily answers to these challenges. I think we could just acknowledge that they're challenges and work on them. So all of this is a process of continuing to engage to address these challenges. But I think it's really important to recognize, first of all, that context is critical. What struck me right away in the very first um, workshop we had on downsizing the donut was the enormous diversity. You couldn't find a greater contrast, I think, than the contrast between the experience of people in India and Brazil and the people in Barbados. Even within the Caribbean, enormous differences in the context in which the people in Costa Rica are operating and the way in which the people in Barbados are operating. And even within the English speaking Caribbean, let me say right away that um, what we are doing in Barbados, I, it would be much more difficult to do this in any other part of the English speaking Caribbean. Jamaica, when people think of the Caribbean, they think all the islands are the same. They are very, very different. We have different histories. We have different government systems. We have different governments. Um, all of that makes a difference. So context is really key. The, the other challenge is the global local connections. And um, for me, uh, Donut Economics and Kate and Andrew's connections at that global level are really important for us to do the things that we can do or we're trying to do at our local level. Because so much of our lives are kind of determined by what is going on at that global level. Um, so it, for me, it's really um, comforting to know that there are people like Kate who, are, who have access uh, to the corporations, the key influencers, like the Pope, <laughs> um, addressing the challenges at that level that in many ways support the local efforts. Um, we were also, I was talking to, to Sharon uh, about context and we were thinking that um, the climate crisis is also a context and the COVID pandemic is also a context. And again, for me, um, what really attracted me to the donut economics at this particular time is what I call the COVID moment. I think this is really a moment in time when things can happen that were unimaginable before, partly because we actually have no control. You know, Mother Nature is just is having her way with us and we're just struggling to survive. Um, that was true also of the climate crisis, but it seems to me that it took a COVID uh, public health crisis to do what even the climate ad advocates and the climate warriors were unable to do, shut down the entire economies, um, curtail the amount of travel. Um, so that context of COVID and climate crisis, um, I, I want to make the point that um, it can go either way. It can go, um, I know I've gone back to the, the, the context because the context within the global local connections, um, it could be worse, it could get worse in fact, um, post COVID. So those local global connections are really important uh, that people keep and particularly in this moment of, of um, COVID crisis, there are opportunities at that global, lo global level that did not exist before. Things that people like corporations are doing now that um, are listening, uh, experimenting uh, in a way that they never did before. And I want to end with um, the biggest challenge of all is understanding history and understanding power. 
Um, Andrew said that they're working on those issues of power. But for us in the Caribbean, we, we had to start by remembering our history, the history of colonialism and capitalism. And we can't change that, but we can learn from it. So the first thing that we learned from it, where we first began having this conversation in Barbados, is that the whole landscape of Barbados was changed by colonization. They cut down all the trees um, to create plantations. All of the wealth of the country was taken out of it. They brought uh, Africans and people from Asia to work in the plantations under the most brutal conditions. So even the questions that we're asking with donut economics, uh, the situation under colonialism was really, really bad. I think I cannot imagine how you would have a donut economics project <laughs> in a, a situation like that. And I think we have to remember that that, that those um, we have we can't change it, but we can learn from it. So what do we have to learn? First of all, I think we can remember that the link between the state and the market has always been a very important connection, and that that connection between the state and the market has often facilitated the most brutal and destructive of our environmental um, practices and has had a devastating effect on our indigenous communities. Um, so we can recognize the legacies of colonialism persist in neocolonialism, or even when it's not mentioned, they persist. You could see them if you examine the relationships between the North and South right now, between Europe and the Caribbean, for example. And I think we need to recognize the need for regulations to curb the worst excesses of capitalism. Um, so that's one of the things we have to fight for. And I think, again, donut, it's a challenge for donut economics because uh, through donut economics, we can perhaps pinpoint those re regulations that are most important. And we can try to return to the indigenous knowledge and practices to regenerate our countries and our communities, um, to do the healing, in fact, that is necessary and will be necessary as we go forward. Of course, not everybody wants to or can take up those challenges. And I'm very struck by the point that Kate and Andrew were making about um, you can downsize to the very smallest um, level of a community of a neighborhood. Personally, I believe that it's at that community level that we have the most control, the most power uh, to act, to make the kind of decisions um, th that we have control over. There's so much that we don't control, but we can control something, our own behavior, our own actions. And it's at that level also that I think there's most opportunity for having fun, for thriving despite everything. And one of the mottos that I have is, how do we organize to live in this world? And to me, that's a kind of a central question that I, that I keep asking myself every time I try to engage with people in, in my community. So I don't know if that's uh, helpful. Um, I just wanted to you know, reflect on what some of the challenges going forward are for people who really want to use and find that donut economics is really a very, very useful tool for addressing how we organize to live. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharon. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sharon and Peggy. That was, that was really, really very helpful and useful, certainly useful for you to share the challenges that you've been facing or that you, you know, the donut economics helps shine a light on uh, as well as bringing your own experience. It's wonderful to hear uh, about the scoping workshops and that that was helpful as well. So thanks for, for sharing all of that. If there are any questions, I haven't seen any questions that showed up in the chat box, but maybe if anyone's if anyone's thinking about it, I was um, I was curious to hear about if there were any next steps that you were planning to make in this approach, more programmatic approach that you're taking. Are there more scoping sessions or are you planning to create 
a portrait um, from a methodological perspective or what's the plan? Those, those four areas for next steps were what we were going to do. We're, we were going to form Slack groups around you know, those key areas and invite people to join them and then continue the conversation and see what arises. That's, that's our next step. We, we've written a report on the session and um, that's where we're at right now. Perhaps I could add to that. Here's where we come back to the context because in Barbados, because we are so small and people are so accessible to each other, uh, because we have a government that is very social justice oriented, uh, despite uh, you know a debt crisis, we have an IMF agreement, so that you know limits a lot of what governments can do. Despite the fact that we depend on tourism, and that's all gone, um, we do have a government that is uh, is trying to live that legacy, um, you know, from from our post-colonial. Um, so there's a lot of work that's going on in those areas, in all of the areas. The data is there. Um, in our scoping events, for instance, we recognize that a number of people are working on some of those. And one of the things that we talked about and we have to work on is to see to what, first of all, identifying that there are a number of people that are doing some of those, some of that work, a lot of that work both on the social foundation and on the ecological limits. One of the organizations, in fact, that, that Donut Economics came out of is CIRMES, that's the um, uh, environmental group that uh, Robin Mahan uh, headed, and uh, which is really like, <laughs> like our host for the work that we are doing in, in Barbados. Um, they've been doing incredible work in, in mapping and in collecting data and in actually working on some of those issues. So we wanted to explore the possibility of identifying different groups in civil society, even and in the quasi governmental area that are working on these issues and to invite them and to suggest to them that maybe regenerate Barbados could be a kind of an umbrella so that there are many different projects and initiatives to recognize those initiatives and to invite the initiatives to consider whether being part of this larger network, which share certain values about, that are the values of, of, of environmental and social and economic and then uh, justice, uh, whether they would find it useful to be part of this larger network. So that's the question we have. And that would be the way in which we would develop that portrait, uh, I think. Um, whether people want to join us, I don't know. Um, maybe I could just say a little bit about, you know, my particular interest, which is in the social foundation, and why we've chosen that particular project going forward. Uh, because we cannot do everything, but we've picked um, the issue of working with women, uh, specifically. So CIRMES has done a lot of work on gender in fisheries, and there is um, a network, an organization of fisher folk in Barbados, actually headed by a woman. There's an organization of vendors in Barbados. We want to recognize that the informal sector of the economy is where a lot of people, most people are in that informal sector. And the people who are not thriving are all in that sector. Their livelihoods are very precarious. So we want to work there. And we narrowed it down to working with those two networks because uh, women within those two networks. And one of the reasons that I want to work there with women is because when you talk to women who are in fisheries or women in agriculture or women in vending, they talk about themselves as producers. They do not bring in the rest of their lives. And yet we have to deal with that, the, the, that, double, that double day, the dual role because what they can do in the fish market and in vending and in the fields and in the factories is very much determined by the kind of support they have in their role in social reproduction. So this project will allow me to build on what has been there before where women are only thinking of themselves as producers 
to invite them to think of themselves and their work that they're doing in social reproduction. And what are some of the projects? What are some of the facilities, the services that would help them to, to manage those dual roles better? And then at a macro level down the line, one of the things I would love to do is to, again, talk to people in those networks about how, what sort of policies at the level of social security um, they would like to see. So first to empower the women to figure out what policies, what they want to see at that policy level. Then to negotiate with their networks, <laughs> to sensitize their networks to these things. Um, so working with the women in these networks would amplify their political voice and enable them to strengthen the capacity of the networks themselves to address the issues of gender and in that way uh, benefit the entire society. One of the, um, the challenges I always have as a feminist activist is that people say, well, you're only looking out for the women. I'm not only looking out for the women. I'm looking out for the whole society. But you cannot look out for the whole society while ignoring the realities of women. So let me stop there because uh, as Kate and Andrew know and Sharon, if you get me on my, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to stop me. So I stop right there. Thank you so much, Peggy and Sharon. Um, yes, it's very, very inspiring to, to hear from you and to hear from your experience and to hear a, a feminist activist pushing for change in Barbados. So it's, it's very clear. And we will, you know, where I'm just privileged and honored to be a small part of, of, of that work. So let me uh, pass on to to Yannick and to hear to share a bit of story from where he is, which is in Toronto, uh, to hear a little bit of a different perspective. So please, Yannick. All right, thank you, bonjour. And, and first off, Peggy and Sharon, thank you so much. I mean, a, a lot of, so many of the principles and the, the ideas and the sharing you just did relate, even though it's a city far up in Canada, uh, I think the society aspects and especially the feminist economics aspect are really, really important as we move forward. So um, I'll, I'll first share my screen. It's always the, the moment of truth. Does it work? Does it not work? Uh, we did test it, so it should work. Here we go. Um, let me know if you see it. Thumbs up, somebody, and we're good. Yes? All right. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank um, you. Yeah, so bonjour à tous. My name is Yannick Baudouin. I'm a director of innovation then for Ontario and North at the David Suzuki Foundation. And as Andrew had started uh, earlier on too, uh, first want to really uh, acknowledge the land that I have my feet on. Actually, I'm on the sixth floor of a building, so I'm floating above the lands, the traditional territories of a lot, many First Nations, the Wendat, the Chippewas, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, um, the uh, Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, so this area, these lands are rich in culture, rich in wisdom, rich in knowledge. And I'll definitely um, uh, touch upon that as we present a little bit today. Uh, I also take a moment to acknowledge my own father's traditional lands, which uh, from the Algonquin nation of Kitiganzibi near what is called Ottawa today. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm taking a slightly different uh, approach maybe today. I, I wanted to sort of share sort of the origin story. How did we get uh, from the discussions of, you know, the whole world of sustainability uh, in Toronto has been on for decades, right? We've talked about it, we've tried, we tried this, we do this, we have this, we have. So what was it now that led to this moment where um, um, that powerful visual, the story that the donut can tell uh, has now connected with, with some of our decision makers, also in community and all that. So I wanted to start a, a little bit off with some fun facts, uh, get a bit into the landscape, the social landscape, the cultural landscape of Toronto, uh, move into a little bit of the donut experience so far, and then leave you as well with, with the challenges. And these are challenges I've noticed. I'm not saying they're the challenges for everybody, but just what I've been noticing in that space. Um, so I also wanted to put a winter picture up there because of course, uh, uh, Toronto being uh, where it is, uh, has spends a lot of time in, in the dark and in the winter, but we still have a lot of fun with it. 
Um, and I also want to just mention, I myself am not from Toronto. I'm from Ottawa. And so there's an ongoing Ontario rivalry. We have the way better hockey team in Ottawa. So we, we, we won't debate that with any Torontonians on the line. Um, and yeah, and then just a little bit of ways of background for myself. Uh, I'm an economist and a geologist originally. My, back, my main academic background was in geology out there in the world. Uh, I spent about a decade in industry. I know extractive industry. <gasps> Oh no, Yannick. Uh, and then into the UN system. And now uh, about three and a half years ago, moved back to Canada after 15 years away. Um, and am now in Toronto for the David Suzuki Foundation, which is one of Canada's biggest environmental organizations. So some fun facts about Toronto. Uh, it is, uh, it has the title, I guess, of me a mega city uh, in North America. It's the fourth largest metropolitan area in North America. It's got 3 million people in the city itself, 6 million in the greater area. Uh, in 2019, it was the top of the crane index. So the most construction cranes in the metropolitan area in North America. So, so I don't know if it still holds that title. I don't know if that's good or bad, just saying, fun fact. Uh, it's also the most tree covered. I didn't even know that until recently. The most tree covered urban area in North America or mega, mega, mega city urban area in North America. So that's some little fun facts to get us started. Um, where did we start on let's say let's call it the journey towards um donuts new ways of thinking about the economy uh all that kind of work and that really started about three years ago in town halls we went out and asked people we simply asked things like what is the purpose of the economy and when we got no answers well at least i didn't get any answer it was very fascinating and this were a lot of town halls in the toronto area uh, by chance. Um, and so then I would ask the question again, what would you like the purpose of the economy to be? And then stuff started flying on the walls, white walls were filled, all kinds of, of conversations were happening uh, all over the place. And this was kind of where um, we, you know, as a foundation kind of got inspired. How do we help bring about some of that reimagination? How do we help align the expectations people have for an economy with the actual act of having an economy. And so, as I said earlier, the starting point isn't new. It's not uh, a blank space that we're starting to fill. It's not a blank canvas. Uh, Tacaronto is an area, um, pre-colonial, uh, you know, pre-colonialism, um, which is filled, filled again with wisdom, experience, knowledge. And we have to recognize that all these nations prior to about 400 years ago ecologically speaking, we're well in the donut, all right? We, there was no idea that you would operate beyond the relationship you had with nature. And, and I'm using the past tense here, very acknowledging that it isn't the past. This still exists today. It is still active today. There are vibrant communities today. And this is a, a, an important source of teachings that we have to start listening. And so again, when we're thinking about sustainability in Toronto as a new thing, it, it isn't new. It's new in the sense that for the last few hundred years, we've now had to deal with something that wasn't here for millennia and millennia before. And so one of my most inspirational economic textbooks these days, not written as an economic textbook, uh, but for me as a, as a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer, a, a First Nation knowledge keeper and also a botanist uh, uh, trained in the Western worldview, but I love her quote, if all the world is a commodity, how poor we grow, when all the world is a gift in motion, how wealthy we become. And that to me is sort of the story we're trying to get to, right? Especially in the Western uh, way of thinking. So, so it's always to acknowledge that the economies that were here prior to colonialism were in balance. And that is an important piece to start from. Toronto itself is a global gateway city, 140 to 180 spoken languages in Toronto itself. The world is here. That means the source of imagination is endless. The source of creativity, of lived experience, of worldviews, all of it is here. So if we're going to recreate an economic paradigm, wow, this is a place to start, right? And I had to put a Caravana uh, festival picture here because it is one of my personal favorite, funnest festivals in Toronto, celebrating uh, Latin and Caribbean cultures. 
And you can't, it's impossible to not have fun with Caravana. So um, I put it in there. And also, of course, this is a picture of when, when you do happen to win a basketball championship, uh, City Like Toronto goes absolutely insane. But again, to show you how vibrant socially and culturally Toronto is, often very undervalued by government systems, by the power systems that we have in place, blind spots to that sometimes. But the reality when you walk through a city like Toronto is very, very different. Toronto is, is a community, it's communities of change. And it's been trying and doing, not just trying, it's been doing all kinds of right livelihood, donut livelihood, sustainable livelihoods for a very, very long time again from arts and environment to cultural backgrounds, to repair cafes, to tool libraries. So none of this is new. The main challenge is it doesn't turn into the main flow of the river. And, and most people don't know why. We don't see the thing that is pushing back against us. And so when we kind of put together the idea for, so again, to me, the, 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 to, the donut for me was a powerful story waiting to be told, not necessarily only the technical side, but that story, the myth that busts some of the myths, not just some of the myths, a lot of the myths, the falsehoods that are entrenched in a worldview that we're still stuck with. And so for us, it's part of a broader picture. We're not just working at the city level. We are looking at reimagining paradigm at a country level and hopefully someday at a global level. But down in Toronto, the starting point is really a tale of two cities. And I just, I just look kind of always referencing that because these are the two cities. So on the right, this is how people live. And then on the left, this is how we get governed. And that's the challenging, that's the blind spots that we don't always see. You can walk through a lived experience in Toronto and the systems, the governance, the economics that doesn't see that, and yet is still the predominant operating the way of doing things. And so when we started to work with Deal on these issues, and, and Kate and I kind of go back to Schumacher College is, is where I met Kate the first time. Um, this to me was one of the most important parts, right? The identities that decision makers have. We often think decision makers are just decision makers, they're politicians, they get elected, they're senior city staff, but no, right? Every individual has a complete mix of all these identities. And how do you surface the more intuitive and emotional identities rather than the, the overly relying on the technical brain-oriented data, quantitative, uh, academic, uh, Peggy was having a nice, we, uh, before this we were talking about academia, it's great. Um, and so that to me was the most, is the most powerful landscape, the, the place we have to put some saplings in and let them grow. And so in Toronto, yes, we've gone through some processes already, a few great workshops, a teaser way back in January last year, uh, and then moved into kind of a more proactive, we have a champion city councillor, uh, Councillor Layton, who's just been on this for so long, his, his father is, is a very well-known, was a very well-known politician in the federal landscape on moving into these spaces of social equity and environmental equity. Um, and so, so that's what started, that's what's in progress. And the kind of the next steps going forward on this are now more to link, not just the city government system, but how do you start bridging and creating new, more participatory decision-making processes with community itself. And sort of like Amsterdam's approach to the coalition, we're gonna to start to put those little pieces into play as well, and hopefully have that not just as a, an engagement piece for city government, but actually part of city governance. And again, I'm not saying that any of this is new, right? There are moments in time where the things we've been doing for a long time suddenly come into play and get absorbed. And I do feel, but I would never want to use the word COVID and opportunity in the same sentence, but for lack of, uh, of, of English possibilities, there is a, an opportune moment in time. Systems have been so disrupted that there's an appetite to not just analyze something differently, but to actually do different. And when it comes to things like policy process, we could do it pre-COVID style, or we could do it post-COVID style, whatever post-COVID might look like. And again, this is where these processes, these ways of sitting around a table together and, and not just using data to, you know, like research reports to analyze the city of Toronto, 
but the actual lived experience of people around that table beyond their professional roles only, also as them being residents of a city, being part of the, the diaspora of the city. But some of the challenges, I guess, and these are things, again, for personal opinion, my experience only, very selfish of me, but I'm just kind of relaying what I've noticed. And it's not just with Toronto. Uh, my UN life was very much facing or noticing the same challenges. And these are things are perhaps where some of the deeper questions have to come about. Um, shifting from an entrenched way of thinking and doing is very difficult. And, and that's not going to be a technical narrative that can change that. It really has to get back into writing, creating, and telling new stories together. Uh, and that's hard, right? It moves right into the same kind of dissonance that we feel decision makers want something different. But taking that leap into the unknown, right? How do you do something differently? Well, take a risk. Ooh, ooh, risk, ooh. Fear right, is a huge challenge. How do you overcome fear? Um, how to authentically invite and embed diverse worldviews? I mean, we like in Canada to talk about it. We like to politically, oh yes, we must do this. We have reconciliation, we have that. But as soon as you get into a deeper closed room conversation about recognizing that all worldviews are, are equally as valuable, Ooh, that's a difficult one. So that's still a big challenge to help get out of the old thinking, to start embracing the fact that, well, that old thinking was only based on half of one worldview, right? A couple hundred white guys that look like me. Um, how do we now start to recreate these systems based on recognizing all lived experience, context, and worldviews? Ooh, very difficult. And that kind of led to that, uh, who knows if Einstein actually said this, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories that he didn't, but we're still stuck as decision makers, as influencers, even in change enablers, in change enabling or the environmental sector, our charities, we want something different, but to, to take that leap to do it differently is still a challenge. We, we remain programmed to stick with the familiar. Um, and so those are our key challenges that are really out there. There's many more, I'm sure. And those challenges for me are also the source of opportunity, obviously, because I think if we can deepen the questions, and again, the donut becomes a visual pathway into those deeper questions. We all want to be in the donut. We, we all want to be sustainable. We all, I mean, I have not met somebody yet, corporate or not, who wakes up in the morning saying, how can I screw the world more today? How can I create more pollution? How can I create more climate change? No one that I've ever met wants that well maybe one ex-president but who knows um that is where the opportunity then lies how do we get deeper into okay we've been trying it for 30 years one way 40 years um maybe it's the way that's the challenge right how do you now turn the pathways how do you connect with wisdom holders from again different worldviews who do literally have yeah no yeah could do this differently um how do you create relationships how do you move from the quantitative to the qualitative? And although it's still very, very challenging in, in, in the Western way of thinking, um, I, I think the cracks are in the wall. And I think we're starting to see the ability to, to move into those space, not preach, not be prescriptive, but really create those co-innovation spaces. So thank you from our founders. Wow, thank you so much, Yannick. Very well done. Thank you for, for sharing all these insights, for the challenges that you're seeing uh, in Toronto. And as you said, bringing in from the United Nations, from your, <laughs> what was it, your geology background, oh no, um, and more. So thank you very much for that. So here we are. We have another few moments and one last piece on our overall agenda, which was the plan to show a little bit of what this document is in terms of the consultation and to announce how it's going to be working. So let me share my screen one last time. And, and actually, actually, no, let me change my plan, which is not something you should do right in the middle of a, of a webinar, but I wanted to, why don't I just take us straight to the document? 
which is, of course, you can see I have far too many tabs open as always. And here we can see is, is this consultation document that I showed. This is a screenshot that I, that I snagged for the presentation moments ago. It's, as I mentioned, it's hosted on Google Docs. And the purpose of this methodology is once again to, it's a handbook for practice building on the previous methodological guide. And given that it's in Google Docs, I guess just a few housekeeping slash caveat notes. One of them is that it's very much a working document. And I just need to reiterate the, the working document-ness of it, because it's, uh, we certainly recognize that the text, the tone, there's content that we know that we want to add and different pieces. But what we were focusing on doing here was to, as early as possible, create a structure and some containers almost that we could invite others to share their experience, share their comments, share their suggestions so that we can then take it into account. And that's essentially the spirit of this, of this document. When we do publish, which will be in the fall, like a more finalized document, we're actually planning on publishing on Google Docs as well. And the reason for that is because the previous version, given that it was a kind of a closed PDF style, it wasn't as easy to, to update and to, to work on an ongoing basis based on the energy that we're seeing popping up. So what we want to be able to highlight is, you know, Melbourne is here, India is here, um, Toronto is doing this, and then all of a sudden now Ottawa is doing something or uh, Lusaka is doing something. Then we want to be able to incorporate that learning and that knowledge very quickly. So we're planning on publishing online, and this is the approach. I will note that when we uh, um, ask for comments and contributions, Google Drive, you, will, you are actually able to suggest text, like if you're familiar with track changes, then you can suggest text right in the document. And we're going to, we're asking, it's in the headers, it's in bold here, we're asking people not to suggest directly inline text, but instead to use comments. And comments in Google Docs are, just to briefly show here, you can highlight any text, you click add comment, and you say, hi, and that's that. And the reason for asking to not provide inline text is because if you're familiar with Google Docs, things there's no way to simplify the markup and things it gets quite difficult to read the underlying document if a whole bunch of people are contributing, which is what we want, but we would like uh, please to use the comments. So with those caveats in mind, I just wanted to briefly show on the left-hand side, again, if you're familiar with Google Docs, you can see the overview of the document which walks you through the principles, which you can see are not even submitted yet, not even added in yet. Here's our donut. And quite importantly, the one of the adaptations that we made is to, again, for those who are very familiar with the previous methodological guide, we've been trying to bring in this, this design concept on unrolling the donut and showing everything very clearly within this space under the ecological ceiling, but above the social foundation is really important to us because what we've heard is the donut is so strong visually and it's simple and it's compelling and it's, it's wonderful. And the portrait in the first version, you started to lose that clear link with the donut. So what we've been working very hard with the designer um, in Amsterdam as well, is to bring that link back into this portrait methodology. So it's very important to us. So we're trying to bring it in here. And other things to note, here we're in the local social lens, for example, you can see, I just wanted to flag these boxes that I mentioned before. So here we have a useful resources box to help if a practitioner wants to find data or indicators or just uh, yeah, those, those pieces, but also these other keep in mind box are of important issues to, to, to recognize and acknowledge if you're undertaking this lens and inspiring approaches. So bring your examples, bring, uh, again, keeping a focus ideally on the specific lens at hand so that we can identify and flag and show others the, the amazing things that are going on. So this is the idea. This is what we are um, opening up now. The, the notion is to do so for s around six weeks. Uh, so take your time and, and we will also be kind of 
working on this document at the same time. So it really is a kind of collaborative process. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I'm kind of been going off script and we have a few minutes for any, any questions. And I've just thrown in the chat, the link to the document itself. So I will, in the meanwhile, if we're waiting for any, any questions to come in, I would love to invite Kate, if you have any comments or any, anything that comes to mind to follow on from that. Um, just to say that this has been, this has really energized me today. Um, I have to admit, I haven't had my breakfast yet today. I got up very early this morning to add some new details into the slides I was presenting. And I'm sitting here, um, with an empty stomach, but with an extremely full head and heart and feeling very energized by this. It's, 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 it's why deal exists. Uh, it's why we created an organization so that we could create tools that we put out into the world in the commons, knowing that there are incredible change makers everywhere who will say that looks useful to what I'm doing. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to adapt it to my context and I'm going to run with it. And, and we just heard two brilliant examples of that this morning. So it, it's very um, affirming for us with this work and, and highly energizing just before we go off on summer holiday as an organization. We just, deal is going to go quiet for August. That's why we wanted to put this document out so everybody could engage with it now. Um, I just want to say one thing that the framework that we're presenting now is around cities and places and towns and neighborhoods and communities and countries. It's very much a place-based framework. And I know that some people are also interested in saying, how can we take this, these concepts and bring them to business, bring them to the world of companies? And that's a huge area of interest. I want to flag it up now because it's also the area where Deal feels the most risk of greenwashing, which I'm sure everybody can understand, right? Some big companies would love to stick a donut on their website, say, yeah, we're doing the donut. And then it gets discredited for everybody. So until now, we've been very tight, actually very, very strict with businesses. We've said there's a tool on our website, if anyone wants to look at it, it's called When Business Meets the Donut. Any company in the world is welcome to use it. It's a tool for internal reflection. So you go inside your company and you sit and you, you reflect. What you cannot do and what no company can currently do is use the donut in its website, in its marketing, in its public presentations. We, we put that in place and it's very, very strict, I know. And the reason is, is to protect it so that we only open it up when we're ready to open it up. I'm delighted to say we have just recruited our first ever business and enterprise lead who's going to be joining our team in September. It's somebody fantastic who's going to do this so well and open this up with such brilliant care. So if anyone's interested in thinking about how this relates to business, and of course, anyone working in place, it relates to business because there are businesses in every place. Please hold off from using it now. Wait and see what happens when we when we start opening this work up, because we're going to make some really great tools that invite business in with a high bar. It's going to be challenging for some companies. We invite business in to explain how business is going to transform to be part of the regenerative futures that we're aiming to create. So that's what I wanted to share. And I've just massively enjoyed this webinar and the one that we held yesterday evening for people more based in the Americas and another time zone. Uh, this is, as Andrew said, the launch of a co-creative co consultation process for this document. It's just going to be the second version of the document. It's never going to be finished. It's going to get richer and better and smarter and wiser through all the ongoing experiences. So if you're sitting here thinking, I want to be part of this, we haven't even begun, then what you may begin now will probably influence the third version of this document. So think of it as a rolling flowing process. So let's let's get to work, let's create the second version, let's bring in everything that we can think of and have learned so far, and let's just make this more valuable and, and a richer experience for all the work that we all go on to do. Um, it's just lovely to be part of this very big team work and it's moments like this, I think, yeah, thank you Zoom, thank you world for enabling us to work with incredible partners around the world in real time, there were gifts of online working, and this is one of them. So thanks so much. Ditto, ditto. Well, on that note, there's there's not really much more to say. Um, besides to thank all of you for joining. Thank you, Zina. Thank you, Mohak. Thank you, Willow, for, for sharing your experiences. And actually, we do have four minutes. There's one last thing that I can ask. Uh, those of you, if you are comfortable with taking a picture, um, 
as a screenshot, as a memory of this, this moment, then I would be very happy to, to snag one of those. So if you could turn on your cameras, that would be wonderful. And we could get a, get a recollection from this time here together. The launch, the launch of the consultation, which once again, we have never done before. So it's all new, it's all an experiment. So one, two, three. Okay, um, what I need to note is that there, I've just realized there are two pages. So, and none of you know who I can actually see. So we need, <laughs> we need to take another one with me on my second page, if that's okay. So at the count of three, I'll just do one more time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, that's perfect. Thank you. Very well, well, thank you. I'm also incredibly inspired. I did manage to have breakfast this morning. So um, I have a full belly and a full head and a full heart and just everything is full and inspiring. So thank you all for being a part of it. I bid you adieu. Bye all, see you. Bye guys. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.